Welcome to this sailing theory tutorial. My name is Julian, and in today's video we're discussing forces on sails and foils and what makes a sailboat go. So in this video, I first want to cover lift and drag forces on sails. Then I'm going to cover lift and drag forces on foils, which are below the waterline. Finally, we're going to add the two together to see what the resultant vectors are in terms of thrust on the boat. So we talked in my earlier videos about how air flows around a sail. We talked about how it creates high and low pressure areas on either side of the sail and how that generates forces on the sail that we call lift and drag. For the purposes of this video, we're not going to worry so much about how lift and drag are created, but we do need to review a couple of things from the previous video. So first of all, lift acts perpendicular to the flow. Secondly, drag acts tangential or in the same direction as the flow. And thirdly, Increases in angle of attack relate to increases in both lift and drag. So let's talk now about everything that's going on above the waterline. The first thing that we know is that we have a lifting force on our sail that acts perpendicular to the flow. So straight up. The second thing that we know is that we have a drag force and the drag force acts tangential or in the direction of the flow. And it's usually smaller than the lift force. If you remember from the video on vectors you'll know that we can add vectors from tip to tail to represent more than one vector as a single resultant vector. So what we'll do here is add the lift and drag on the sail and represent them as a final resultant vector called E for effort. I want you to pay careful attention to the location where the E vector starts. We'll come back to it in a later video. Now that we've dealt with what's going on above the waterline in a simplistic way, I want to talk to you about what's going on below the waterline. Below the water, a boat has a set of foils. They're called foils because they have a hydrodynamic or aerodynamic shape to them like this. The two foils that you have below the water are your rudder and your centerboard, daggerboard, or keel, depending on the boat. If we imagine for a moment that we have some ideal boat, it might move through the water in a direction that moves from stern to bow, like so. What we know in real life, however, is that when sailboats move through the water, they have a certain amount of side slippage to them. And this side slippage is called leeway. The side slippage occurs in the same direction that the sail is lifting. Just like we did with our true boat and apparent wind velocity vectors in an earlier video, we can find a total resultant boat velocity vector by adding the forward boat by adding the forward boat velocity to the leeway boat velocity. from tip to tail. 
And we can call that V over water. By similar reasoning to that that we employed in my example in the vectors video about a person holding a string on a stick. If we have a boat moving through the water at a certain velocity, v over water, it's reasonable to say that from the boat's perspective, what it feels is water moving over its foils in the exact opposite direction. And so what we're going to draw is another velocity vector that represents the flow of water over the foils. And I'm going to call it the flow. What we can see now is that the centerboard of the boat has a particular angle of attack made with the velocity of the flow. And in fact, so does the rudder. What that means for us is that these hydrodynamically shaped foils are going to generate lift and drag, just like the sail does above the water. Because water is far more dense than air, the forces that are generated on these smaller foils are actually comparable in magnitude to the forces that are generated on the sails. What we have is a lift vector that occurs in a direction perpendicular to the flow and a drag vector that occurs in a direction tangent or in the same direction as the flow. And so, just as before, we're able to add the lift and drag vector together and I'm going to label it here with an R for resistance. Believe it or not, the rudder actually generates a similar set of lift and drag vectors, but they're smaller because the rudder's smaller. So I'm going to draw them scaled like this. Now what, again, what we know from vector addition is that if we have these resultant vectors pointed in the same direction, we can copy them and add them together. So what we end up with is two vectors. One is the resistance vector from the center board, and the other is the resistance vector from the rudder. And finally, if we sum those two resistance vectors, we get one big long resistance vector that represents them both. So above the waterline on our sails, we have a single force that we're calling the effort force. But we know that it's really a combination of the lift force and the drag force. Similarly, on our foils below the water, we have a single force that we're modeling as the resistance force, but we know that it's really the combination of a lift force and a drag force on both of the foils. So what happens if we add the forces above the water to the forces below the water? If we copy our effort force off of the above water diagram, and move it down onto this combined diagram, which for the time being, we'll just say that the forces act on the hull and completely ignore the sails and the foils. Next, we can copy the resistance force. If I paste the resistance force and add it tip to tail with the effort force, we see something interesting happens. We have another chance to make a new resultant force, and this one we'll call the thrust force. Something that's special about this thrust force is that it's pushing the boat forwards. In a simplified way, this is what makes sailboats sail forwards through the water. Now I want to talk to you about the relationship between leeway and the amount of lateral resistance force that the foils experience. So as we saw before, the water flow vector 
is made up of the boat's forward velocity plus the boat's leeway. Now what we can see here is that if we had a bigger leeway vector, in other words, if the boat is side slipping more, the flow vector would rotate aft. What that means for our angle of attack is that it would increase as well. I want you to think back to my video on sail trim and stall. Remember how we said that higher angles of attack lead to both higher lift and higher drag forces until the foil stalls? So what we can see then is that if we have a bigger leeway, our foils generate more lift. If our foils generate more lift, we end up with more resistance force. And if we have more resistance force, we end up with less leeway. What this means is that we have a self-stabilizing system where a boat might be blown sideways, but the more it gets blown sideways, the more it tries to resist being blown sideways until it eventually develops a forward thrust vector like we showed before. And I want you to think about the motion of a boat through the water. They don't seem to wildly accelerate sideways. They seem to accelerate forwards. In fact, if a boat is moving at a constant forward velocity, we could ask ourselves, how much leeway will the boat be experiencing? The answer is just enough so that the lateral component of the effort vector is exactly cancelled out by the lateral component of the resistance vector, as I'm drawing here. What do I mean by lateral? By lateral, I mean perpendicular to the center line of the boat. At this point, while we're talking about angle of attack, I figure it might be worth mentioning what happens when we turn our rudder. So if we turn our rudder onto an angle, the angle of the oncoming flow stays the same. And what we effectively do is either increase or reduce our angle of attack. In this case, we turned our rudder so far that we flipped our angle over onto the other side of the flow. So what happens if we turn our rudder really, really hard? If we turn our rudder really, really hard, we open up such a large angle of attack that the rudder is likely to stall. Again, I'll remind you what the conditions of stall usually mean. They mean that the lift vector gets very, very small and the drag vector gets pretty large. You can see then why when we turn our rudder really hard to one side or the other, the rudder doesn't become very effective for steering. It does, however, become a pretty big handbrake. Now I want to use the resultant vectors that we've been talking about to explain to you why we have different amounts of leeway on different points of sail. Here I've drawn a boat on a close hauled course. For our reference, I want to draw the center line of the boat. What we know is that the thrust vector acts parallel to the center line of the boat, so it points straight forward. The resistance vector is the vector that makes up the difference between the thrust vector and the effort vector. What we can see is that the resistance vector is just long enough to bring the effort vector back to the center line of the boat in a path like this. If we scroll down, we'll see a boat on a beam reach. Again, we would see that the thrust vector points straight forward on the boat. And the resistance vector is going to be the difference between the effort vector and the thrust vector. Finally, on a broad reach, we would again expect to see that the thrust vector points straight forward on the boat. And the resistance vector would be the difference between the thrust vector and the effort vector.
What we can see in these diagrams is that we have a far larger resistance vector for the close hauled course than we do for the broad reach course. And the beam reach course is somewhere in the middle. Remembering back to our reasoning that larger amounts of leeway resulted in larger amounts of resistance force, we can see that a close hauled course would have more leeway than a beam reach course, which would again have more leeway than a broad reach course. Does this make sense to us? Well, it should, because on a close hauled course, the force from the sails, the effort force, is pointing more perpendicular to the center line of the boat. And as we bear our boat off, the effort force points more in line with the direction that we want our boat to travel, until eventually we get to a broad reach or a run where the effort force is pointing in almost exactly the direction that we want the boat to travel. So this concludes my sailing theory tutorial on forces on sails and foils, what makes a sailboat go. In this video, we looked again at lift and drag on sails, and then we looked for a first time at lift and drag and the forces on a sailboat below the waterline. In the end, we looked at the resultant thrust vector that happens when you add the lift and drag from both the sails and the foils together. We used information about the direction of our effort force above the waterline and the required size of our resistance force below the waterline to bring the thrust force back to point forward and backwards to make determinations about how much leeway a boat will experience on different points of sail. In conclusion, we determined that a boat on a higher point of sail will experience more leeway than one on a lower point of sail. Thank you for watching.